now we're going to discuss some of the benefits and challenges of the integration that Lars brought up in his keynote. And we have this morning a distinguished panel of experts to have that discussion. Um, as the panelists come up to the stage, I will give you some background on each of them. Um, Dr. Dr. Tan Yu Chong is the Secretary General of the Ministry of Water, Land, and Natural Resources of Malaysia, and his responsibilities include overseeing the sustainable development of the water supply and sewer services industry, as well as performing managerial functions in the ministry. His main tasks focus on the formulation, implementation, and review of policy directions and the regulatory framework of Malaysia's water services. Bernadette Conant is the CEO of the Canadian Water Network. She leads her team to work to improve the application of water research to decisions for water management. She founded the Canadian Municipal Water Consortium, whose members, which include leaders from progressive municipalities, as well as industry and academic partners, to collaborate on critical water, wastewater, and stormwater challenges. Sylvan Usher is the executive director of the African Water Association, based in Côte d'Ivoire, and their objectives include to coordinate the search for knowledge and the latest developments in the technical, legal, administrative, and economic fields for drinking water and sanitation, as well as promoting the exchange of information and initiating um, professional training. Jian Wu is the president of the Potent Environment, Environment Group Limited in Beijing, China. Uh, they provide environmental services in China and internationally. They offer smart water environment management, ma management systems, invest in, implement, operate, and manage water supply, sewage treatment, and reclaimed water reuse projects, and are involved in integrated management of water services and build sponge cities and water ecological towns. So now we have uh, about 20 minutes for discussion, and I will start out with an initial question for each of the panelists to answer, um, and then help guide the discussion along the way. So, so no, no more than two minutes for this first question. Um, so Copenhagen has been able to address climate change and sustainability through an integrated utility, though not without challenges. So in two minutes each, no more than two minutes, can you describe the most critical challenges you have faced in trying to integrate sectors, services, or sustainability objectives uh, in your work? And let's start with you, Dr. Tan. Thank you, Abby. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in the Malaysia context, the integration of utilities, particularly water industry, there are three major challenges faced by the Malaysian government. So firstly, about the uh, political uh, will. So second, about the uh, institutional reform. And third, with regards to the uh, execution. So let me start with the uh, first point, political will. Due to the complexities and, and fragmented of the water industry in Malaysia, there are several ministries uh, involved in this uh, program and activity, particularly the, the policy formulations. Uh, previously, we have Ministry of uh, Energy, Water, and Green Technology. With the new government, uh, we formed the uh, new ministry on 2nd July this year. Uh, the, the name of the new ministry is uh, Ministry of Water, uh, Land and Natural Resources. The main objective of this ministry is to integrate the uh, water resources, water services, and uh, sewerage and also irrigation into one ministry. For, uh, and we come up with a new uh, water management uh, framework. Uh, and also, we would like to incorporate in the land. So land is part of the uh, ministry, uh, play a very significant role, and also the natural resources. We combine the uh, water sector into the natural resources in terms of uh, water, land, and particularly the conservation and sustainability. We need the strong political will to, to transform the industry, uh, particularly in, in, in Malaysia context, 
we have federal government and state government. So constitution power, uh, segregation of power between 14 states and also the federal government. So with that strong political will, we can, uh, we can uh, engage with the state. Then they come up with the, the integrated uh, water management policy. Uh, the second point I need to f uh, highlight here is the institutional reform. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, due to the complexity, now we form this uh, uh, CATS, we call it acronym called CATS. So this ministry uh, mainly responsible for the policy formulation, uh, legislation, uh, guidelines, and, and, and the monitoring. Then how we want to uh, come up with a good policy uh, and turn into uh, best practices. Firstly, we have the uh, National Water Resources Council, headed by uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Now, with the new ministry, we would like to propose the National Water Council, more holistic and more integrated, it will be headed by the Prime Minister. And second, this uh, uh, national, national Water Resources Policy and National, national uh, Water Services Commission. And also, we have this uh, National Water Services Act. So we integrate all these uh, major policy and turn into the uh, uh, water integrated uh, management framework. Right. Th thank you. We'll, we'll talk more about that integrated framework yep. in a second. And Bernad the, and Bernadette, the, let, let, move on to Bernadette if you'd like to. Right. Thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you to Abby and to <laughs> Hella and Lars and also uh, to IWA for um, the privilege and the pleasure to be here and uh, continuing the important conversation. And I think continuing that conversation is going to be a key theme. So Canadian Water Network works with municipalities, but government, private sector across Canada. Uh, we're one of those bridge organizations that uh, Mark Van Lutstrick talked about yesterday with the express purpose of helping them either accelerate, advance, or improve water management decisions. So what that does is help us focus on the driver side of, of the decision. So, you know, in answer to your question, it's, it's not what I have seen, but I'll give you my sort of Canadian perspective on what we've seen as the barriers, and uh, particularly for uh, utilities in, in terms of the question. And they really come down to two big things. Number one is governance. And I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about that and our CEO of one of our most in innovative utilities in Halifax always points to that and said, if you get the governance right, the rest can flow. Um, if we're talking innovation like we have, I might sort of have a, a code, a subsection of those is culture and clear goals for that governance. But that structure is, is definitely number one. And the second big one I would say is actually trust. And I'll talk about that really briefly. Um, so the governance is really what we're talking a lot about here, about how we organize ourselves. And in our case, not just how we organize the doing, but how we organize the access and making sense. So really, when I talk about what Canadian Water Network does, we try to help make sense of all the information that's out there for decisions. And that requires that we uh, organize, or the challenges are organizing in a way that does two things. One, the integration needs to be enabled. So you've got to create mechanisms that allow that to happen. And Dr. Tan talked about some of those reforms specifically focused on that. And the other, it has to require integration. So integration doesn't happen for integration's sake, and we talked about that, or multidisciplinarity for the sake of being multidisciplinary. So things like Lars talked about um, the ability to have a goal, like we must be carbon neutral. Um, that causes his integrated utilities to go uh, towards that and others. So those, those were clear. The other one I said was trust, and I think it's not a new one, but it's the biggest one. Um, a phrase that I often used over the years, when we were, particularly when we were working with the academic and the knowledge sector, was when it comes to decisions, it doesn't matter how right you are if nobody believes you. And we really have generated a culture, we're so focused on being right, uh, but that doesn't mean we're effective. And so 
when I went to many of the sessions that talked about, well, how were you able to do it? And uh, we talked about culture change and things uh, like that in the sessions yesterday, but it really comes down to if people feel that you're not talking to them. So I'm not a big fan, I have to tell this group, I'm not a big fan of the use of, we must educate everybody. If everybody understood all the facts, we would do the right thing. Because I don't think, I think there's too much for all of us to be educated. I think the bigger issue for our utilities is um, trust, it's the same thing we use inside companies. If you trust that we have a shared goal, we might have a discussion about, well, you're going to do it one way, I think you would do it another way. But we're not feeling that we're having a battle over the goal. So moving from uh, education to engagement and getting trust is a big one. And I actually am an, a pragmatic optimist, because right now the trust in governments is very low. Generally, at least in, in Western Hemisphere countries, and uh, if you look at a article that was in the paper in Canada last week, trust in scientists is decreasing. So uh, rather than wring our hands on that, I would say the opportunity is to become a trusted place uh, to look for. If you believe that people have the same goal, uh, that, so those, gaining those two things, we think are, are, are what we see are at the core of it. Great, thank you, Bernadette. Jian, can you give us a perspective from China? Uh, yes, um, thanks, Abby. Um, I come from China and also um, from the private sectors, so I can provide uh, some of the, uh, the perspective from both private sectors and from China perspective. Um, as you know, in the uh, recent years, China, uh, Chinese central government has uh, paid much more attention to uh, sustainability and environmental improvement, and which create a huge um, um, opportunities um, for the business and also for the investment. For the next five years, we estimated that it's going to be about around two trillion U.S. dollars will be invested in the local utilities around the countries. Um, as a private sector, uh, we have participated over about 30 um, local utility schemes uh, through the private, um, public-private partnership, which is called uh, PPP schemes. Um, there's many challenges around um, that, uh, the implementation stage of that, uh, but there's two most important. One is how you convince um, the local municipalities uh, to develop uh, an integrated utility schemes, um, which really needs to start from the feasibility study, the mass plans, which are not only sure, uh, looking at water, and wastewaters, but also you need to look at how to control uh, the stormwater control, the flood controls, and also connect it with the entire river basins. So it's more an integrated process and in systems, um, not only address the water supply and the wastewater treatment, but also the entire river basin and for the entire uh, uh, regions. So. In China, it's sometimes easy because all you need to do is to convince the mayor or the party secretaries, because we have a very strong government. And uh, but the really um, the devil is the devil is in the details, which is how you coordinate with all the different departments uh, when uh, during the, uh, the implementation stage. So that's the first one. The second one is really how you help the local government to pay for it because um, um, it's really, um, through the financing, you can build it and uh, you can uh, implement it during the, um, uh, the starting stage, but how do, you, how do you help the government to pay for it? Then you really need to look at it, how to create a value for the cities. You know, um, not only uh, you clean up the river basin, but uh, uh, also you create it, <clears throat> maybe you, you need to do the landscapings, you know, around the river bankings and uh, uh, to make, the municipalities and the cities more livable, and the people want to live there and create the land values or create the social values um, for the entire cities, and also um, um, to also help the local government to um, introduce and to attract uh, more business and maybe healthcare business, you know, more business in the cities. So at the end, the government can pay for those schemes. Great, thank you very much. Sylvan, I mean, the Water Association covers all of Africa, so you're working with lots of countries. What are the challenges that you, uh, you will remember countries face? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Abby, for, for this question, and thank you for International Water Association for inviting me. 
Uh, I think as a association of water and sanitation utilities, I will speak as uh, uh, the perspective of utilities. I think that, uh, first of all, in uh, multi-service uh, providing, uh, Africa started earlier. I mean, Africa started in the 60s when um, utilities that were doing uh, energy were also doing water, providing water to the population. But in the late 70s and 80s, things were changing and separation was coming in and the two sectors were definitely working at a separate level. But today we don't really see if there could be an advantage with the concept of multi-service uh, multi providing. In this, we uh, have encountered, let's say, four factors that definitely are, are, are giving us some, some uh, insight on, on what is happening. First of all, there is not enough decentralization. I mean, uh, municipalities, some municipalities are very young, so they cannot really uh, uh, think about, at this level, think about having multi-service uh, providing a service, providing in water or in sanitation or in, in uh, energy. Also, what we have encountered is that uh, in most of the African French-speaking country, you have one utilities that is providing for the, for the whole, the, the whole uh, country. So um, with decentralization that is not really, uh, pers uh, uh, not really effective, it is difficult for the uh, municipalities to have a choice on what they're doing. Uh, secondly, when they have been empowered, meaning in places where municipalities are running things quite well, uh, the funds are missing. Like my predecessor said, my predecessor said uh, money is something that municipality needs to implement this kind of, of aspect. The third aspect is the population. Uh, the potential customer for these utilities, the potential number is still quite small. So it should be quite difficult for a big company trying to do multi-service to have enough customer to really run properly, properly, properly the, the, the business. And the fourth aspect is regulation. Uh, regulation is important in this kind of thing. We need to have a very strong regulator because so many things can happen with a multi-service company inside the economy of this company. So we need to have a, a very important eye on that. So uh, multi-service is good, I think, but in Africa we still need to look at it very closely. Yeah, thank you very much, Sylvain. So the last point there you made about regulation, um, we've got a couple of con uh, countries here with quite a strong central government and strong mandates in China and Malaysia. Um, Dr. Tan, you mentioned um, at the end of your speech about the integrated water framework. So I'm wondering how your ministry actually cascades down this intention for integration to the utilities uh, themselves to actually to, to enact on that. So, very good question. So just now I mentioned about the two uh, elements. Uh, first is the political will. Second is the institutional reform. And the third aspect is the execution, the, the how aspect. So through our new, newly established ministry uh, and also the uh, National Water Services Commission, we, we, we regulate the industry uh, via licensing. We give the water operator, water utilities pump company, issue the license, we set the KPI for them in order to comply with the KPIs for the water quality, the capex, how to, to, to come up with the new capex. At the same time, we have the uh, Water Asset uh, Management Corporation. So we, we provide fund for the uh, water operator uh, uh, to, to come up with the new uh, projects and a program for the new capex developments. So it's very important. Uh, the funding is important. We have the good policy, but in terms of execution, we, we need to engage with the various stakeholder. Again, our stakeholder, uh, inclusive of the, uh, the water operator and all the state, all the state, because we want to uh, share the integrated uh, water policy with the state to buy in. So, uh, in terms of jurisdictions, we are clear. So, we focus on the policy formulation. The state focus on the uh, implementation, the execution mm -hmm. part. 
So that is uh, the, the main concern. So again, we integrate these uh, three, three major challenges and, and uh, from the policy we turn into practices. Practices at the same time, uh, uh, with the strong political will, I strongly believe uh, we we can really transform the industry uh, towards uh, water resilience and 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 uh, sustainability. So that is our ultimate objective of the uh, the new way forward and the new direction of our new ministry. And at the same time, we have just uh, established the vision and mission objective and the shape value for the ministry. The next step, we come up with a strategic uh, action plan. So with uh, this uh, four days uh, Congress and uh, when we gather the new input, then we can uh, uh, formulate the good action plans for in the future. Great, thank you. Um, so Bernadette, in Canada, the, the system is a bit more decentralized, not quite as top down. And you talked a lot about governments, governance, trust, um, and culture. So how, how does it work in Canada with uh, all the various municipal level uh, utilities and stakeholders? Great. Well, it, you correctly thought when I heard decentralized and we talked about systems, I, I think about that as a good description for government in uh, Canada. And that probably describes uh, or explains in part my view that, that relying on these. Things. So philosophically, having a proper institutional structure and all the right goals that require these things to happen. I think we're all in agreement. But I think in Canada, it's very difficult to make that work. Uh, so it's really mm -hmm. about how to make all this, ha making them work together um, is important. And we talked about, you know, in China or in Singapore, there is no Lee Kuan Yew equivalent in Canada who would just say, make it so. Um, for those of you who are more familiar with the US um, system, in Canada, for instance, for drinking water, the federal government puts out guidelines for safety. They're not federally enforceable standards. Almost all the decisions that are made, there, there are, excuse me, there's some regulations, particularly on the wastewater side, um, that uh, set limits for discharge. But by and large, the activities that happen, the governance pieces that really matter, are at the provincial or state level. And in practice on the ground, it's how those are implemented um, in terms of licensing, in terms of approvals that really make it work. So actually working with those, uh, I, I would say the community uh, utilities, mm -hmm. in my estimation in the last 15, 20 years, are the ones that are taking the lead. Mm -hmm. I tend to say that Canada is a lead from the middle country rather than top down or bottom up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, that maybe explains my emphasis on trust because it's really about trying to find where the ability to move in the existing system is and then make a case for changes to go forward. So by nature, just as you, by nature of the very system, uh, we get better progress when we work within it and try to build uh, sort of coalitions, if you like, for, for progress than we do about sort of uh, lobbying and institutional reform. So that's much more part of the Canadian culture as, as, a, as a people, but also it's necessitated by the system. Makes sense. Um, so Sylvana had mentioned that financing is a big issue, but Jian, you'd said that you have two trillion dollars worth of investment from the central government. Um, as a private utility working with um, with those governments, do you have an easier time integrating services in your utilities then, or is it still trying to convince uh, the municipalities the benefits of um, uh, integration and sponge cities? It's a good question, and uh, oftentimes I perplex myself on that question as well. So um, I think uh, in China, uh, well, first of all, two trillion is the amount of money which is needed for the plan which is laid out by the central government. It doesn't mean the central government will spend the money, but the money is needs to be uh, um, um, collected. Um, I think every municipality, most of the uh, municipality in China, they want to do it because a lot of times it starts from the scratch, especially uh, for the rural areas. Um, it's not really whether, uh, I think it's easier to convince that uh, the party secretary, the mayor of the cities say, you need to start from, uh, as integrated systems, mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning with the mass plannings, uh, with the feasibility study, but I think it's um, the most, um, the biggest challenge is you need to convince them in how to come up with the, with the monies. 
not only the financing part of it because the banking want, you know, can do that, but also how to pay back for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, so that's, um, wh what we need to do is to help the local government is not only looking at how to establish those infrastructures, but also help them to say, uh, after uh, you improve um, the living standards, the environmental conditions, uh, of the local cities and uh, how do you create the values and economic and social values, which is uh, um, one is, uh, you know, uh, land values uh, in China, there's a lot of um, um, social value on that is on the land. The other is to attract um, the travelers, uh, to attract the people to come to your city to spend mm -hmm. the monies, uh, and also to uh, help the local government to um, uh, attract um, new business. Um, now in China we call it, you know, upgraded uh, uh, consumptions, which mainly uh, green consumption like healthcare, uh, sp uh, sports, uh, recreation. So it, it's easy for us to ask them and say, you need to do that in the right way, and uh, but also you need to help them say how to pay for the right ways. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so Sylvan. But it changed a little bit, but Lars mentioned uh, sort of the Emerging Leaders program that they do in Copenhagen, and I'm wondering, from your perspective, what do we need to be doing to set the stage for future generations to manage utilities in an integrated way, and what are, you know, what are you doing with the Africa Water Association? Okay, um, I think if we come back on the multi-service aspect of, of mm -hmm. what we, we, we're dealing with, we, I would like to, to distinguish two things. First of all, the multi-service, the municipality's mm. utility, which is multi-service that municipality owns, and a private utility mm. contracting with a municipality, which is another aspect of the thing. Um, the issue that we have here is transfer of competencies in the water and sanitation mm. sector in most of the African cities. Um, when you look at the English-speaking countries in Africa, they are decentralized, meaning that utilities are from the local government and they work for the local government and are monitored by the local government. In the French-speaking countries, you mostly have a utility that provides service all over the country. And unfortunately, in these cases, the transfer of competence from the, lo from the, the, the uh, main government to the local government for uh, water or sanitation or even energy is not effective. So that's where the issue comes because I think that multi-service uh, providers work for the, for the municipalities. It is the municipalities that have all these aspects to be dealing with. Um, we at the African Water Association are looking for the years to come really to uh, empower young water professionals. We have a young water professional network that is growing and growing. And uh, these uh, young water professionals are really oriented with the uh, high level uh, uh, technical engineers or, or, or MDs or water utilities. And we are really pushing them, pushing the utilities to empower, empower more and more young water professionals. But this is definitely things for the future. They have brilliant solution. We saw here at the uh, innovative sessions uh, many young guys with very, very good ideas. And I think that this can help uh, at a level for the multi-service providers uh, at a time to come, definitely. That's great. And so on that note, I think we are out of ta time. But I'm glad to end on that. And I think just to summarize the discussion, um, it's not really so much the technical uh, barriers that prevent integration, but it's very much institutional ones. And I think it's different based on where you are, whether it's about political will or governance or sort of government collaboration with municipalities, um, or if it's just uh, empowering the next generation to be able to do this. But, um, and then of course financing, I think we didn't get a chance to talk about that. But um, we're, so it's good to hear that we're sort of focusing on empowering people, whether that's through um, building trust or building the next leaders. Um, but thank you to each of the panelists. If you can uh, join me in thanking the panelists for the interesting discussion. Thank you.